Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Nathan Tai, and I welcome you to our Brown Bag Lecture Series at the Kearney Public Library. Um, the series is sponsored in partnership with the Department of History at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, as well as the Kearney Public Library. And they're held on the second Wednesday in selected months um, here at the Kearney Public Library, although usually across the way, uh, but they're taking blood um, in our typical rooms. You can do afterwards if, if you have extra blood and would like to donate it to uh, the Red Cross, uh, you know, good question. If you ask, you can, I don't know. Um, I scheduled the series as well as information about all of the History Department's programming is on our website at unk.edu backslash academics backslash history. Um, but before I introduce today's speaker, I want to again thank the Colonel Library for their ongoing support of this series. Um, which we've now expanded. We, we do it every month, um, year round, thanks to the support and encouragement and interest of the Carnegie Public Library and our wider community. Um, we have upcoming talks uh, on July 13th. Dr. David Vale uh, from the Department of History here at UNK will be giving um, a, a talk on his, his upcoming book, uh, Vulnerable Harvests, Risk and Resiliency in the Cold War Great Plains. So if you're interested in agricultural history, Cold War history, Great Plains history, this, this, this will be a, a very fascinating um, and energetic uh, talk. Um, and then on August 10th, uh, Lena Homburger Cordia, who's a doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, uh, will be sharing her research, Invisible Futboleras, uh, Gender Nationalism and Sport in Mexico and the World in the Early 1970s. So, so women uh, football players in, in Mexico um, in the 1970s during, during the, the Women's World Cup. Um, please stay in touch for a schedule of our upcoming talks and other local history events, as well as highlights of our student and faculty research service and community engagement. See the History Department's website as well as our social media pages. We are very active on Facebook and Twitter, thanks to uh, Dr. John Biggs. Um, but today, our topic is our editress, Nebraska's first female newspaper editor. And our speaker today is an alumni of our history program, uh, Dean Michelle Sedlick. She is an educator and community historian with master's degrees in history from the University of Nebraska at Kearney and management from Doan University. She serves as associate dean of business and entrepreneurship at Central Community College and is a history adjunct in the uh, history department at University of Nebraska at Kearney. Her family roots are deep with seven generations calling Hall County home. She is a Hall County Historical Society board member, Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation trustee, a freelance journalist contributing historical articles, including a really good series on uh, true crime in Grand Island to several publications, including Grand Island Independent, and an active community volunteer devoting her time to historical preservation and education. And uh, please save any questions until the end of the talk, but please join me in welcoming Dean Settler. <laughs> Um, and I, I just have to say real quick, uh, I do have two master's degrees, the one from UNK and uh, the one from uh, Doan. One is for my passion, one is for my career. So um, I, I'm so happy to be here um, and I was happy to be invited by the University of Nebraska Kearney because uh, like I said, this is my passion. So the uh, subject we're going to talk about today is actually the subject of my master's thesis and someone that I have for many years um, admired and wanted to dig in a little bit more. And the more I learn about her story, the more fascinated I am. So I want to introduce you to Maggie T.G. Everhart Mobley, and that's how she signed her byline. So Maggie was born uh, Ma uh, Margaret Teresa Guerin on October 23rd of 1846 in Limerick, uh, Ireland. And it was at the height of the Irish famine. She was the third and the youngest child uh, and daughter, all three of them were daughters, born to Daniel and Margaret Guerin. So during the summer of 1849, the Guerin family, including the daughters, Maria and Kate and Maggie, all departed Limerick and traveled to Liverpool, England, where they boarded a ship um, aptly named the New World to depart for New York City. And it was said too that those who um, were fortunate enough immigrated to the new world. Those who were less fortunate immigrated to the next world. Fortunately, Daniel Guerin was uh, pretty well off as an engineer, and so he was able to take his entire family of five to the new world. So when they arrived in the United States, the Irish in America were um, 
most of them went into trades. And Daniel Guerin, as an engineer and mechanic, he ended up going to Albany, New York, where he worked in the canals. He worked there for about a year. And then they left for Peoria, Illinois, where he worked on railroad lines. Unfortunately for the Guerin family, uh, 1851, so just not long after they arrived in the New World, Daniel Guerin passed away, leaving his wife and three daughters. And unfortunately for the three Guerin daughters, their mother passed away shortly after. So by the age of five, Maggie was already orphaned. So the three Guerin sisters were, were left without their parents. Fortunately, they had really kind neighbors who took them in and made sure that they were educated in the way that their parents had hoped for them. So Maggie, she actually went to a school in South Bend, Indiana called St. Mary's Academy. And she received her sisters with the Holy Cross. And if you aren't familiar with St. Mary's Academy in South Bend, um, the brothers, uh, the other order, the brothers, formed Notre Dame. So that was the area that she was in. And the Sisters of the Holy Cross, the mission of St. Mary's was to provide girls with an education of the highest standards in various branches of arts and sciences. So their library was stocked with thousands of volumes um, on history, science, biography, travel, poetry, um, fiction. And it really was at South um, Bend at St. Mary's where Maggie really developed and sharpened her skills as a writer and exhibited a taste for literature and poetry. Um, she wrote many, many poems. Unfortunately, not all of those poems exist anymore, but she um, was a very talented uh, poet as well. After she left South Bend, she went to Peoria, Illinois, where her older sister, Kate, um, was living at the time with her brother, um, with her husband, William Shuley. And when she was living in Peoria, Maggie, this is where she started working as a teacher, as a school teacher, um, and began submitting articles for publication, um, both prose and poetry. And she found like-minded individuals in Peoria who also shared her passions. And she joined the Peoria Literary Society um, and actually became the society's secretary. Howard, 1921, as often happens, a charming man um, crossed paths with her, and she married him. He was a news dealer from Omaha, Nebraska. So she was 21 years old when she married a man by the name of Alvin Everhart. Um, so October of 1867 was when they married. And actually, they married in two different ceremonies. They married in one in Chicago in, this, in the home of her sister Maria. And then they married in Omaha as well, where Mr. Everhart's family was. But Maggie removed to Omaha then with Alvin after the marriage. Unfortunately, the marriage was not what she had hoped for. And about a year later, um, Maggie left Mr. Everhart in Omaha, and she ventured west herself to North Platte, Nebraska, which at that time was not um, a huge community. It was a very small community. But she arrived in North Platte sometime um, in early 1869. So she's 23 years old, three year old at this time. She's living in North Platte, Nebraska. Her husband's back in Omaha. Um, and so she does what women did to support themselves. She became a school teacher. And she was teaching school, but then she met this 24 year old former army soldier by the name of Seth Mobley. And Seth, his experience had been, um, he had grown up in Iowa and he had um, worked at a newspaper office. He'd actually apprenticed at a newspaper office in Iowa. Um, but in 1861, he enlisted in the military during the Civil War, and he was actually attached to Fort Kearney. And while at Fort Kearney, he established a newspaper there. Um, it was called um, the Field Mess. Let's see, he was a Field Messenger. Sorry, back this up in here. The Frontier Index. Actually, it was called. It was called the Carney Herald, and it was renamed to Frontier Index. So Maggie, with her talent for writing, met Seth, who had knowledge of the newspaper business, and they decided to partner and join forces. So that really is where the newspaper started. And the newspaper started in North Platte. So January 1st, 1870, was the first issue of the Platte Valley Independent. 
And on that first issue, they declared that it was for the benefit for the citizens of North Platte, McPherson, and Grand Island. Sorry, Carney wasn't listed at that time. <laughs> but um, the salutary uh, address declared that it would be a live, wide awake, independent, and unsectional newspaper not devoted to political squabbles. Um, but it would be for the general prosperity of the country. And it was a four page newspaper at the time. And they only had six subscribers when they started. And uh, but within the first 90 days, it grew to a six page newspaper with more than 300 subscribers and advertisers from across the Platte Valley region. Um, and even for that very first issue, there were businesses from beyond North Platte. There were actually Grand Island businesses that were um, buying advertisements in the newspaper. So it grew very quickly. And the price of a subscription was uh, $3 for an annual subscription, which honestly today, if, if you kind of extrapolate that out, that's about $65. So that's really not unreasonable with today's prices. Okay, so Maggie, this is where we start to get into um, some of the things that are uniquely Maggie. So Maggie's time in North Platte was short-lived. They, like I said, they started in January of 1870. However, by June of 1870, and actually specifically June 11th, uh, her time in North Platte was coming to an end. She wrote an editorial about a man by the name of Marston. His name was J.P. Marston, and he was the foreman of the Union Pacific shops in Omaha, in uh, North Platte. She says, now, I do not have turn of mind to do such work at that hour. So in this editorial, Maggie laid out her case against this foreman. So she and in her solitary address said that she was going to be strong in the denunciation of wrong in every human form. And she did. She laid it all out. She laid the entire case out about him in the newspapers. She accused him of being a coward, of a dastardly character with the heart of a devil who threatened his workers. He fired good men out of petty spite and then tried to extort them if they wanted to get their jobs back. Um, he accused, she accused him of putting the owner of a local boarding house out of business by threatening any employees who would reside there with termination. Uh, she then continued, and I mean, she lit into him. Uh, she accused him of moving lumber, bricks, and other building materials from the company shops at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is why the industrious um, turn of, of mind to work at that hour, um, to build his own house. And... She said that um, if she had gone, not gone into the story blindly, but had taken the time to investigate, she believed the story should be treated for, uh, fearlessly in the next issue on June 18th. However, the next issue on June 18th, it was reported that Maggie had left North Platte. <laughs> um, Mr. Marston and his crew came to the office and they were demanding um, justice for, for this man. Um, so she left North Platte. She actually came to Grand Island, and Seth was closing up the shop in North Platte. And they began issuing the first issue of the Grand Island Independent, or the Platte Valley Independent in Grand Island. And Marston himself actually um, threatened Maggie um, with a libel lawsuit, which was dismissed. And um, he was dismissed from the railroad himself, too. So there was truth to her story. Um, he did not stay along with the railroad either. And it's kind of interesting too, if you go out to the museum in North Platte, the Lincoln County Museum, there actually is some information about Marston and Maggie, although it has just a little bit different take on the story. <laughs> um, but so after six months of being in North Platte, um, Maggie moved to Grand Island with the Platte Valley Independent. So on July, of 1870 was the first issue of the Pot Valley Independent published in Grand Island. And um, they declared they were able, fully able to run a newspaper, or actually it was the Nebraska State Journal that declared that Maggie and Mr. Mobley, Seth Mobley, were fully able to run a newspaper and they give him Godspeed. So they thanked those reporters in Grand Island and Omaha, again, sorry, Carney wasn't listed there, um, who came to their aid and enabled them to keep the paper going in a new, new community. Um, 
they declared um, that when the paper was first published in North Platte six months ago, that everything had been going against them. And they relied on people there to support the paper, but they were uh, foolish enough to believe and be led by a certain clique. So they were like, it's not our fault. It's the people that were there. You know, they, they thought, you know, they let us believe that they had our backs and they didn't. I, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but when they arrived at Grand Island, they said that they had every possible encouragement from all the businesses in town um, without a single exception. And that the citizens received them so kindly, they already felt perfectly at home. Uh, they also declared in that first issue that they would abstain for the time being with meddling in politics. Um, although they did say that if they were to be asked specifically, that they would tell them that they are solidly in the Republican Party. Um, but they were going to devote all their time and efforts to promoting Hall County and the adjoining counties, and that's where all their time and energy and space of the newspaper is going to be devoted. And they're um, they were going to be promoting immigration, supporting men and women um, within the community, supporting men of worth regardless of any party affiliation for office and um, discussing all these interests of topics of interest that were both to the county and um, town readers as well. So on their second issue of the newspaper, again, they were talking how great it was in Grand Island and, and how supportive they were. And they said in the first hour or the first day of being in Grand Island, um, they had been extremely flattered by the support they raised about $950 in advertising on that first day, and they sold 60 more subscriptions to the newspaper on that first day. Um, so things were really going well, and they said, if the citizens continue to support us um, with the same zeal they now exhibit, we surely will be able to, to furnish a newspaper that will do both a credit and support um, and benefit to this community and the country. And they were grateful to the community for the aid and pledge that we do their very best to retain their goodwill and confidence. Okay, so now remember, this is Seth Mobley and Maggie, Maggie Everhart that are business partners. They are not married. And Mr. Everhart is still living back in Omaha. And Maggie's on her own here in, in uh, the middle of Nebraska with her business partner. Well, Mr. Everhart, <clears throat> and it's kind of interesting how they live their lives. They live their, and, and this is why it's so much fun researching them is, they really live their lives through the newspapers and um, put everything out there. So Mr. Everhart had tried to publicly shame and discredit his wayward wife in October of 1870. Um, and she was very, very loyal to her friends. If you were her friend, you had her utmost loyalty. But if you try to cross her, you better expect her wrath because it was coming. Um, and so after his public shaming and attempt to discredit her, she struck back, not with her fist, but with her pens, with her pen. And so her response was, we do not believe there is a firm in the United States foolish enough to trust anybody on that loafer's account. Maggie T.G. Everhart is abundantly able to provide herself without asking to be trusted on the account of a person who is known to be loyal and dissipated. All of the brimstone in the infernal regions will not make a fire sufficiently hot for the proper punishment of a man who would so abuse his wife as to compel her to go into the cold, unfeeling world to battle for herself. And then, after she had done this, endeavor to injure her credit and throw obstacles in the way of her self-support. And if that wasn't enough, she then laid the sense of debauchery, meanness, and neglect upon his head. And then she went ahead and named Ida White as the prostitute who was keeping company with him in Omaha. <laughs> and then she cast herself in the role of a woman who had been thrown upon the world and now must provide for herself. So as he was cast in the role of a, a villain, again, she, she promised him all the fire of, of brimstone for his treatment of her. Mr. Everhart um, did finally consent to a divorce not long later after that. <laughs> So the Great Chicago Fire, um, and it's kind of interesting too, when, when people think about people living during this period of time, they think they're pretty stationary, they got to one place and they stayed there, they didn't, they were so mobile, they moved around all the time, they traveled a lot, Maggie traveled a lot back to um, Illinois, her sister Maria was living in Chicago, her sister Kate was living in Peoria, so she was traveling back and forth all the time to go see her sisters. 
And it was on one of those trips in October of 1871 when she was visiting her sister Maria in Chicago um, that they were caught by the Great Chicago Fire. And Maria's house um, and her entire neighborhood was burned to the ground. And Maggie later wrote that she um, escaped with a little more than the clothes on her back, but all the houses on her sister's street have been lost to the flames. She did stay in Illinois for a short while after that, recovering from the effects of the fire. She wasn't burned, but I think it was probably smoke inhalation. Um, but when she returned to Nebraska, um, Seth Mobley, who was her business partner at the time, proposed they change the nature of their partnership. And so they were married on December 9th, 1871 in Omaha, one day after uh, she and Alvin Everhart secured their divorce. And it's kind of interesting too, because Mr. Everhart married the next day. I think that was <laughs> another reason why he's ready to get rid of his wife. So the role of the newspapers during this time really was to be a booster press, especially in the Western communities. And the Platte Valley Independent took that wholeheartedly. So in 1871, in Hall County, there was a board of immigration that was established for the purpose of aiding facilitating immigration to the county. And as part of that, and unfortunately, Maggie, you know, during this time, women didn't have a lot of rights and they didn't have the power of the vote. Um, and so it's kind of, this is where it's really interesting with Maggie is she's really influencing a lot of things in the community, but she doesn't have the power to vote herself. Um, so Seth represented her in those places where she couldn't go, but, uh, and so he actually was part of this all male board um, for different community leaders and representatives to um, establish this county, um, county board of immigration, but they actually had convinced them to use the independent to help distribute information about the Platte River Valley and um, specifically the region around Hall County. So the County Board of Immigration entered into an agreement to buy 100 to 200 of the Platte Valley independents to be distributed then to newspaper to new immigrants coming into the country and even in the old world. By the end of their first year in Grand Island, um, they declared that the Platte Valley Independent had passed the darkest hours and had nothing but a promising future ahead of them. And Maggie wrote that in their year since they arrived in Grand Island, they had strived to keep the best interests of Hall and the adjacent counties in mind and were extremely gratified to report that in that period of time, um, the wealth and population of the region had increased at least 100%, maybe a slight exaggeration. Um, but she also noted that it was the newspaper was instrumental in that growth. And um, she said that no other locality in Nebraska had such an increase in this past year um, than central Nebraska. And she also thought, you know, that within that next year, that it was quite possible as no one, um, that Grand Island would become most of the important, one of the most important points in the state being located centrally in, in the state. So the other role of the independent and other newspapers during this time was to really be a community advocate. So between 1871 and 1872, um, there was a lot happening in Grand Island. The, um, there was a bond on a special election to build a new courthouse on a block donated by the railroad. And um, the county buildings had been previously spread all around and were in desperate need of repair, including the leaky jail, which the independent wrote about um, multiple times that prisoners were escaping from the jail all the time. Um, and, and some of them were kind of interesting too, because like the jailer one time took a prisoner out to go collect his items that had been drying, his bedding and things. And he proceeded to walk inside the jail uh, cell before the, prisoner and so the prisoner just shut the door on him and left. Um, unfortunately also, I mean, it was, and it was like the third time this guy had escaped, um, but he kept coming back because apparently he needed a bed or was cold out or whatever. So, but it, it was very easy to escape from the jail. So there was this big push to, to build a new courthouse, a new jail, and the independent was supporting the bond initiative. And if anyone's familiar with Grand Island, um, Pioneer Park, which is downtown Grand Island and the historical society, we just reconstructed the fountain at Pioneer Park. So when you're ever driving down, it's between First and Second Streets in Grand Island. 
that's where the original Hall County Courthouse was. Um, so the independent was instrumental in um, helping promote that bond initiative and it passed and uh, they were able to get that new jail. They also, Grand Island was incorporated in 1872. So we're gonna be having our sesquicentennial celebration soon. Um, and Maggie, again, she has a lot of sway over, over people, but she can't vote herself. And uh, she wrote before the 1873 city convention when they were starting to uh, write their regulations and laws and books. She said that she encouraged voters to select men who were sober, capable, and honest. And if the answer was affirmative to each of these traits, then party shouldn't matter. And she also encouraged the um, the new newly elected representatives to um, have a few but few laws that are just and properly and strictly enforced and ordinances not intended to be carried out should not be passed because it was best to have just a few laws that were enforced rather than hundreds of pages of meaningless and unnecessary ones that lie dead on the ordinance book. So she really is trying to influence the establishment of the um, political and um, the county government structure in Hall County and the city of Grand Island. And then there was what is referred to as the great capital removal scheme. And Maggie wrote that we don't intend to blow our own horn very loud yet, but when the time for the capital removal arrives, we expect it should be located in Hall, the center county. And um, it was actually the daily uh, State Journal in Lincoln that report that christened it the capital removal scheme. And the independent uh, said that all intelligent people knew that the capital would be moved during the next section of the legislature. Um, but she said again that Grinnell had the most central and accessible location of any of the competitors. Um, they had natural resources that could not be equaled. Uh, there were a lot of communities who were vying for the capital to be, to be removed to them. Um, and and actually, I don't have that number in front of me. It, it failed like by just a handful of votes. I'm thinking like two or three votes that that capital, because the capital could have built, left Lincoln. Not necessarily that it would have come to Grand Island. Um, there would have been uh, something after that to try to figure out where it was going to go. But it almost moved out of Lincoln. The legislature almost approved that removal. Didn't happen. But again, they were pushing for the capital to move to Grand Island. So the mobile is also um, in the printing office. They didn't just print the Platte Valley Independent. They printed multiple um, newspapers. They printed um, business cards and they printed all kinds of different materials. They were for hire. And the mobile has actually started a couple newspapers, including the Howard County Advocate. Um, that was the first newspaper published in Howard County as well. And that one actually um, it's changed names over the years, but the Phonograph Herald actually came out of the Howard County Advocate. So that newspaper was also started, which is still in publication. So actually it's a, a Mobley newspaper. The Daily Fair Bulletin, The Mirror, um, The Orchard and the Vineyard, those were newspapers that people had printed at the, the Mobley Mobley printing office because they had the capability there to do it. The editor of The Mirror though, remember that name. So during the 1870s, the Platte Valley Independent faced increasing competition in Grand Island from new publications, including the Weekly Times, the Grand Island Democrat, the Antimonopolis, and the Mirror, who had been published at the Mobley Mobley office. Um, with Maggie Everhart Mobley now at the editorial desk of the Platte Valley Independent, she often found her safe on the defensive with these new editors. And this actually is a quote from Maggie herself, who said that all individuals necessarily have enemies, also does the newspaper, but none and none but the greatest foe would expect them to be without. So, okay, sorry, Carney here, but um, Rice Eaton, who is with the Carney Press, had apparently a war of words with Maggie Mobley, according to the State Journal and from Lincoln. And um, the State Journal also said that the, the war of words between Maggie and uh, Rice Eaton 
um, they were speculating that if it didn't terminate in smut and vulgarity, they would miss their gas. So <laughs> apparently it was, yeah. And I have not gotten into the Carney Press, though. If anyone wants to go research that and see what was actually happening. Um, even though we're, there were challenges by rivals, the plot value independent continued to increase the number of subscriptions and advertisers. And by 1879, Maggie claimed that um, her newspaper had the largest circulation of any county newspaper within the state. Her claim was challenged, though. The Sydney Telegraph said, had challenged her claim. And her response to that editor was, state the amount you're willing to wager, put up or cease your clatter. <laughs> so the Nebraska advertiser then weighed in on that and the, from Brownville, and they reported that Maggie dried up the uh, telegraph of her response and congratulated her with a hearty, that's business, Maggie. So the boy editor, Seth Mobley Jr., um, he arrived in Grand Island on May 17, 1873. And they had a lot of hopes and dreams um, for this little boy um, who they saw as their future editor. And they were sure that he was gonna take over the business for them and it was continue to grow. Unfortunately, 18 months after Seth Mobley died, or was born, he died, um, and his sister didn't have a much better fate. But it's also interesting to note that, that during this time, the Howard County Advocate they were starting that newspaper in Howard County while she was pregnant with Seth Mobley Jr. So she really was a working mother. So she was pregnant. She had the newspaper. She was running in Grand Island. She was starting another newspaper in, in Howard County. And she's fighting all these battles with all these editors on all kinds of fronts. So continuing the war years. So the times specifically. So um, there was this. And this actually was Robert Manley had called it, um, Dr. Manley, he reported there was a ring of unscrupulous, incompetent, and dishonest men um, within the county. Um, he wrote this in, in his book, Platte Valley Chronicles. And he said that they had raised a howl, the Platte Valley Independent had raised a howl about this county treasurer who defaulted on $6,000 and then fled to avoid prosecution. And the friends of this man were in high places and supposedly helped him escape and evade charges. So Maggie was calling all of these people out and including the, uh, in that group was Charles Williams, who was the editor of the Times. And so they had this big rivalry back and forth. And there's a lot of things that you, as you're looking back and forth between the Times and the um, Independent, they were back and forth. And a lot of them were about politics. So both the Times and the Independent were public newspapers. And even though she had vowed to not get into political squabbles, Maggie got into political squabbles all the time. She reported a lot. And she let people know what she thought and who she thought should be elected and what was going wrong in the party and, and people that were doing wrong. And um, so apparently, at different points in time, based on what Charles Williams is saying here, that um, he must have been called a bolter or an ass um, by Maggie, and I, I don't doubt that at all. They were supporting different nominees, um, and they did not they did not have a cordial relationship at all. And then there was the Mirror. So the Mirror again was a newspaper that started publication at the Independent Office. However. And again, there's different accounts of how and why they ceased publication at the independent office, but they ended up going over to the Times to get their newspaper published. Mm -hmm. And after they went to the Times, then, then Wiley became really bold in calling out Maggie on different things. And so in December of 1874, J.J. Wiley, or J.I. Wiley, who was the editor of The Mirror, had published an editorial and it was um, it was titled advice to young men seeking wives and it was supposedly a satirical post um, but he said in there that it was peculiarly unfortunate that the man who has a wife who knows more than Egyptian mummy and then he started talking about Seth Mobley and um, said that when Seth arrived at the conclusion of congratulating himself on his own happiness while being uh, while living is inverse to the rule. And um, 
So basically, he was calling out Seth Mobley and saying, you know, you have this wife who she um, is very bold, very brash, very outspoken. And in his um, editorial, he, he cautioned young men seeking wives to not mistake strong mindedness, brazen effrontery, and woodholisms, which are adjunct, um, adjuncts of conceit and anger, ignorance for refinement and intelligence. So he's really slandering Maggie. Um, sometimes in a little bit of a sly way, but he he's slandering Maggie and Seth and their relationship. You know, Seth has this wife who's very out there. She's very outspoken. She's um, not afraid to say what she's thinking, and um, Seth is letting it happen. So he must he must not be um, that intelligent of a man. So after this happened, so the Mag the Mobley, and it was reported um, with by the Weekly Times that within a quarter of an hour. So 15 minutes after the mirror started circulating, that the Mobleys were seen on the warpath and parading up and down the streets looking for that damn little cuss Wiley. <laughs> Seth Mobley was the first one that found Wiley and he gave him a verbal thrashing. But that wasn't enough for Maggie. Like I said, she was really loyal, but if you crossed her path, you better work, watch out. So um, she found herself a good strip of rawhide, and, um, and it was actually reported to not be a cheap John affair. I'm not sure what cheap John affair means, but uh, apparently a really good whip. And then she went to the Grange Hall where the Sons of Temperance meeting was being held. And after the meeting let out um, and Wiley exited the hall, Maggie raised her arm and um, declared, now Mr. Wiley, I will settle with you for your insult. And she brought the whip down on him he then proceeded to wrestle it away from her. And even though she didn't have her weapon anymore, she still had her fists, and so she popped him in the nose with her fists. Um, and the, uh, the Daily State Journal reported that they were glad that someone was finally cowhided in Nebraska after abusing an ink slinger and noted um, that Mrs. Mobley had struck the offender with her delicate fist after he had wrestled it away from her. And um, Seth Mobley actually wrote an editorial in the next issue that confirmed that Maggie did cowhide a fellow writer for writing and circling an article reflecting on her personal character. And um, he said that she was goaded into it and she was being goaded into it by attacks of her character and personal enemies of the Mobleys were, were out to get them and, and specifically her. And so he really, um, he really supported her and he said that she and he also kind of alluded that Wiley was being influenced by others, maybe even Mr. Williams with the Times. Um, and he was the um, a contemptible puppet of those individuals. So she did how hide the contemptible puppet. Um, so it was kind of she too. Shortly after this happened, there was another um, Hell hiding of a newspaper person in Nebraska. And it was an Omaha editor who took offense uh, to someone, something that someone else said about his sister. And so he, he took a buggy whip to them as well. Um, unfortunately for the Omaha editor, he uh, was prosecuted. Um, he faced a fine of $1,000 for his actions. There was no fine against Maggie, but she definitely gained a reputation at that point for um, not be one to be dealt uh, to be troubled with. So after that happened, an attempt to take over the newspaper. So a man um, by the name of Fox, he was supporting George Thummel uh, for office, and the Independent opposed George Thummel. So what Mr. Fox and his allies did was he actually went to the bank where the Mobley's had the loan on their press and um, he bought out their mortgage and then tried to foreclose on their news on their uh, press to take over the newspaper office. So unfortunately for Mr. Fox, it did not go well. Uh, within just a matter of a few hours, the Mobley's raised enough money to pay off the $650 that they had left on the mortgage and, and kept hold of their newspaper. And then there was Mr. Hetty. So Fred Hetty actually had been um, 
in Germany, he had worked in the newspapers in Germany. He'd actually taken on Marx. So, um, but he, Fred Hetty was one of the first settlers in Hall County. Um, he came in 1857. And he and Maggie got into this real war of words um, in kind of ratcheted up through the election of 1882. And in August of 1882, Maggie wrote that the land office crowd, which included Hetty, sent their mercenaries out in the county to ply voters with money, lies, and whiskey freely. And they tried to trick and defraud voters into supporting their delegates and uh, for the Republican convention. And then she declared that Hetty was endeavoring to spread um, himself all over the state in political affairs. And um, she said that he imagines he's the only German in Hall County that amounts to anything. And um, that Hall County should not, that no one in Hall County should even wink without asking his permission. And um, so there was this big, and I mean, if you look it up, there's during the 1880s, um, the 1881, 1882 period, there's all these different things back and forth with between Mobley and, and Hetty. Um, Hetty specifically had said one thing was the introduction of women into political life would only tend to excite their ambition and would undertake a brain work beyond their mental power. That's part of a larger editorial he had written about how women were not equipped as men um, to have the capacity to undertake things such as uh, political uh, such as political life. And this is also, if you remember, at the time too when Nebraska was. Um, 1882 was when Nebraska was uh, had the petition for women to have the right to vote, had gone before um, the public, and Maggie Mobley was one of the signers of the petition that Elizabeth Abbott had been circulating to get uh, Nebraska women the right to vote. And um, Fred Hetty and his Sons of Liberty were definitely against that, and so he wrote a, wrote a series of articles about how women were not equipped to handle political life and they didn't have the capacity. And um, so this whole thing went back and forth, back and forth. And I, I love this quote from the Central City Courier who said, if Hetty had half a sense, he wouldn't quarrel with a woman. <laughs> and um, Maggie had her supporters around the phonograph in St. Paul, which had been her newspaper, but was no longer issued a review of, um, of Hetty and in this argument and said that's the kind of Republican that Hetty is. So they were they were supporting Maggie through this this whole period. So then there was a year of transition. And before I get to that, I wanted to say real quick, I think it's really interesting that and people don't realize how many different newspapers there were published. In Hall County alone, there were 32 newspapers that have been published in Hall County since 1870. And many of those, like I said, the Mirror, the Times, had tried to take down and discredit um, the female editor of the newspaper and even tried to take over the newspaper. And it's kind of interesting that today we don't have the Mirror, we don't have the Times, we don't have any of those other newspapers, but Maggie's newspaper survived. So at the age of, but however, it didn't continue beyond um, with Maggie for long. At the age of 38, after only 14 years as editor of The Independent, Maggie relinquished her role. Um, she had some health issues, and uh, that's a whole other story for a whole other time, that had plagued her for many years. And she was unfortunately unable to physically continue working in the newspaper office. And Seth himself had increasing responsibilities outside the office that was restricted his time um, in publishing the newspaper. So the Mobleys actually sold their newspaper to a man by the name of Liverner House, who published his first issue as editor on January 5th, 1884. And at that time, it was renamed from the Platte Valley Independent to the Grand Island Independent. And it continued under him for about six months until which he sold the paper in the summer of 1884 to Maggie's most recent adversary, Fred Hetty, who then Continued, and then he made the independent into a daily newspaper. And I, and I do have to say, Maggie and Hetty in later years, um, they were allies. You know, I think, and I think that's the thing too. She respected people who had strong opinions. She she was stood up against people that she thought were doing wrong, um, but she was a big enough person that she would 
she would respect other people's opinions. So in later years, when Hetty was the editor and she was living in her rooms um, in downtown Grand Island, he actually had a complimentary issue of the Independent delivered to her at her at her lodging every day. Um, so they did in later years reconcile. However, this is actually from my thesis. Um, I wrote and. Pardon me while I read this real quick. I, I, I'm a, I think this really kind of sums up her life. From an immigrant child to an orphan educated by nuns, to an aspiring writer and poet, to a school teacher, to an abandoned wife, to the first female newspaper editor in a new Western state, to a community booster, to an agrarian advocate, to a mother, to an inmate in the asylum, to an advocate for the humane treatment of patients, Margaret Teresa Guerin Everhart Mobley evolved into a woman who passed through all the changes of life to emerge from the storm and sunshine and drink deeply from the Purian spring that she might satisfy the want of hungry more the wants of hungry mortals. Um, and and the thing about the insane asylum, that's another story too. <laughs> <laughs> so that is Maggie Everhart Mobley. Have to, you have to give us a little bit of hint. <laughs> <laughs> um, the asylum? The asylum. So yes. Okay. So she was she was committed to the asylum in Lincoln, and um, there were a lot of different speculation. Um, even today, there's a lot of speculation about why she was committed because she wasn't there long, um, and she was released, which wasn't very common that she was released from the assignment. Asylum, and while she was there, she actually wrote an anonymous, anonymous letter to an Omaha newspaper called The Bee um, about the treatment of patients in the asylum. And uh, she signed the letter Nemesis, and she encouraged the legislature to investigate the treatment that was happening in the asylum, and especially her, um, that she was locked up against her will. And so um, there actually was an investigation and um, the legislature had a special session when they investigated they called in different people they actually determined that she um, was not unjustly committed um, so she did stay there for a short period of longer and then she was later released and then after she re was released again she traveled around the state uh, talking about the uh, treatment of patients that she had seen in the asylum especially herself and the way she was treated, and um, she again encouraged the legislature to investigate. And they had another session, and she came in and she testified before the legislature as well. So, how much longer after she left the newspaper did this happen? In the um, that was in 1890, and I don't have it in front of me right now, but it was uh, like 1892, 1893 was when she was committed. Is that, is that pre Dick Nelly Blunt? It's after Nellie Bly. So that was actually one of the theories that people had was that she was kind of trying to do an expo, kind of like Nellie Bly um, had done, that she had herself committed and then she had herself released. So that's one of the theories that people had. Um, there were other theories that people had as well um, about why she ended up there. And there have been different things that had written at different points in time talking about why she was committed and people were speculating. And what I found was they were all wrong on the reasons why she was committed and why she was released. And um, I found kind of a little hidden passage and something that I had incorporated into my thesis, but my thesis is embargoed because eventually one day I hope to get a book written and explain why she was committed to the asylum and how she got released. So, but yeah, so I, I can tell you that much. So she, <laughs> she did, she was committed to the asylum and she, and she spent a period of time there. And, and interesting enough, too, and I'll put this out there because that isn't really uncommon knowledge. The time that she was committed, during that period of time she was committed, was when Seth Mobley was Nebraska's commissioner to the World's Fair in Chicago. So the entire time he was gone in Chicago, she was committed to the asylum. When he came back, she was released. So what did Seth do? I mean, I know he was kind of behind the scenes here, but... He was the publisher, and then after they sold the newspaper, he ended up going back and working for Hetty at the Independent as the business manager. And then he was the, the Chicago World's Fair uh, commissioner from Nebraska, 
Um, he started another newspaper and then he ended up, um, he went into government service and he actually died in the Philippines as um, an ambassador. How much? I mean, I think the and, and maybe divorced him too after the asylum thing. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> I, think, I think the Wiley piece you got there is, is pretty convincing that you know these two hated each other. But how much of the other wars of words that you got here are uh, really truly heartfelt anger, and how much of that is I need to sell copy? So, <laughs> there uh, could have been know, back and forth. There, there could have been some of that, but you know, like I said, Maggie was not afraid to say what she thought and, and kind of get it out there, and I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there was. But I, I do think there was also some grudging respect as well, like I said, from her and Hetty of, you know, the things that they wrote about each other were kind of vicious, but then later on, you know, he, he did support her and, well, you know, her husband worked for is her, her husband worked for him later on, too. Yeah. So, so is, was there really hatred? Was, I mean, she makes a perfect foil, doesn't she? She does make or, a perfect you know, foil. Like, yeah. I'll just poke the bear and then I'll get some response and then we can yeah. sell copy. You know? Yeah. yeah. We'll get a, we'll get a controversy where there isn't any. You know? Yeah. And, and she was a very outspoken, very educated woman. And <laughs> and Hetty actually, I mean, he really did have some strong thoughts about women and what women were capable of and, and the realm that they could be in. And um, his wife didn't work outside the home mm -hmm. at all, you know, and and she didn't have, you know, the kind of say that Maggie had out there. So I, I do think that, you know, he had some very patriarchal thoughts. And Maggie was, you know, kind of the antithesis to, to what he was, you know, trying to do. And and when she wasn't in the newspaper business anymore, and, and she wasn't his, you know, adversary, her his visible adversary, I think that they kind of did develop into a friendship. And and even, and even before that, she had, you know, um, a relationship with Hetty before that, and then it just kind of evolved, devolved a little bit, and then I think it kind of came back. But um, even Stolly, you know, she and Stolly had a real war of words. Um, so she rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, but um, like I said, she she was speaking up for the underdog a lot of times too, and, and I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Do you have um, more context about other women as editors? I mean, there were a lot of women who had who ran newspapers and suffrage organs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but so she, but, but she is um, your subject is definitely. <laughs> doing men's work as a woman, which was very controversial and explained a lot. But do you have more of a context of um, women doing that in so, the newspaper business? So there were, I mean, not a lot, but there were some, especially in the Western states. And I did, in my thesis, I, I talked about some of those Western female um, writers. And then there was down in um, Southeast Nebraska, and the name is slipping my mind. Huh? Claire Beckwith Colby. Um, well, is that the one she and her husband had the newspaper in Brownville? Beatrice. Yeah. Yeah. She was in Beatrice. Beatrice. Okay. So, I mean, she was, you know, obviously contemporary. She didn't, wasn't the editor. She was reporting for the paper. I think her husband was the editor of the paper, if I remember correctly. Um, and when, um, Worth wrote her book about Nebraska women who were um, in the newspaper business. She did, I mean, she did talk about Mobley, but it just really, really just kind of brushed over Mobley a little bit. She talked a little bit more about later um, Ellen Worth when she wrote about um, women in the newspaper business in Nebraska. Um, so I, I, like I said, I, Maggie was the first female newspaper editor. And I don't know that Colby was an editor though. She owned. Paper. Did she own the paper yeah. with her husband, right? No. And it was 1883 to 89. She okay. was in the actress. Then she went to Washington, D.C. and later Portland. Okay. So then there's a different one I'm thinking of that she and her husband were partners in a newspaper in Southeast Nebraska. So yeah, Colby divorced her husband because he was a scumbag. Yeah. <laughs> Which is what Maggie did to Everhart. And then she divorced Mobley, too. So. Um, so yeah, anyone ever tells you that divorce is something, you know, it's not. She divorced twice. Um, so, I mean, there, like I said, there was not a lot 
that I found of women who were in that business during that period of time, especially in the West, but there were some, there were some. And I think that's what makes her so interesting is, I mean, for 14 years, she ran this newspaper and she's, she helped, you know, shape a community and influence the establishment of the government and the schools and uh, the roads. And she, she talked a lot about politics, not just local politics, but state politics. And she was also involved in the Nebraska Grange Association. She was, um, she was actually in, uh, one of the officers in the Grange Association. So she had a really significant role statewide too. And so she would travel around the state and she would give different speeches um, at different organizations and different things. So, you know, I think, and, and like I said, she, she did sign Elizabeth Abbott's petition for, for suffrage. Um, I think she was a little bit ahead of her time maybe in, in this, this era. But I think there were a lot of women that were ahead of their time during this period that weren't really recognized as such. Um, and I, I think she was just kind of, she was in the perfect place in Grand Island at, at that point in time. I think there were a lot of people who were like-minded. She had a lot of supporters. Um, she had a lot of friends. Um, and then she did, like I said, have these people that were back and forth with uh, these challenges she would have from others. But then she would get these like, these little shout outs from all over the state from different newspapers, you know, like way to go Maggie or, you know, give them, give them hell or, or whatever. And, and so I think, you know, that's, that's really what's interesting. And look at her newspaper just turned 150, which is kind of impressive because all those other newspapers are long gone. Um, and she was, she was stood. What were her health issues that forced her to retire from the paper? Uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So her hands physically, she couldn't work with the presses anymore. And she would go for treatments all over different hot springs and things that she would go to for treatments for her arthritis, which I, I, I think also the more research I do, um, it's possibly might have been why she had miscarriages that she had to. Um, it kind of sounds like, like that information might have been impacted that as well. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, arthritis was the issue. And it's also unfortunate too, that the three, and her sister Kate actually did come to Grand Island. So when she was expecting her son, her sister Kate and um, Kate's husband, William, moved to Grand Island to help take care of the child and while Maggie was running her business. Um, so, but all three of the Molly sisters, none of them had children. So there's, there's no one in that family. The line just ended. Thank you. I appreciate you. And like I said, I appreciate you inviting me to come. This is fun. And I'll, 